on. I'm going to continue with Dr. Ronade. Uh, as I said, you know, he's well, the, amongst the most famous names that I know on the economy. And uh, Dr. Ronade, we heard Mohit speak about uh, the Indian real estate on the residential side, and he also referred to the Indian economy, which was growing at 7% uh, per annum, whilst the real estate wasn't really growing uh, at that uh, pace. And then suddenly, uh, COVID hit us. Uh, would love to have your opening remarks uh, on really touching probably two or three things. One is, uh, you know, when do we get back uh, the economy to the pre-COVID levels? Uh, we hope that the low interest regime, you know, continues. And uh, where do you see real estate uh, within this uh, overall economy? And what do you think is its uh, contribution going to be? Thanks, Anuj. Uh, thanks for the very kind words. And thanks, Mohit, for the great uh, opening remarks. Wonderful to hear about uh, your your views and outlook. And uh, first of all, you know, real estate has become a very respectable term, <laughs> if I may say so. In a lighter way, you know, I, I know that I'm kind of treading on something maybe. But, you know, the more formal the economy gets, uh, so we are we are seeing a transition of more what I say formalization of the economy from informal to formal, and therefore real estate is uh, is a very important uh, part of the economy. And uh, let me just uh, illustrate by one little point, uh, Anuj. See, everybody, uh, you know, Marat Hindi me bolte ek motti asman. Everybody aspires to have a little motti of real estate, you know, uh, uh, maybe. But you know, if I can't, if I am. Uh, a middle class, a lower middle class person, I can't afford to buy a two crore rupee home. But surely I want I want to spend, I want to invest five lakh rupees in real estate. So uh, the formalization of the economy, what I mean is that uh, that's what it makes it possible. I'm not talking about a five lakh, five lakh rupee home. I can get a piece of that pie. The, the, so uh, with the evolution of uh, more formal structures of the economy, formalization, whether it's real estate investment trust, real estate investment vehicles, uh, actually, you know, so all that stuff means, you know, traditionally we say in India, uh, we have some 20, 25% of national economy, national income as savings rate, but half of it goes into real estate and land. And we traditionally poo poo that by saying, oh, that is unproductive investment because it's illiquid. What the, we mean by that, it's not as if rest of the world doesn't invest in land and, and maybe gold as well. But there, the real estate, uh, housing, everything is financially integrated. It's very much part of the financial sector. It's very much uh, part of the formal economy. What is happening in India is we are seeing this tra 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 transition. And, uh, you know, every successive year brings uh, much bigger, much better financial integration of the real estate sector. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's my opening uh, observation. And even before the budget, by the way, in December, as you know, in Mumbai city where we live, had the highest sales, I think, in what ten years or something. And That's right. uh, I was privileged and fortunate to be part of that committee, which had recommended that stamp duty cut. I think Mr. Parikh, of course, led the, and uh, it had a remarkable effect. But uh, just if you allow me two three minutes, uh, the the reason I think the budget was a landmark budget is because of uh, I think five factors. Very quickly, first of all, uh, no new taxes at all, because prior to the budget, there was a lot of talk of assess. If a cess, uh, COVID cess, or a uh, inheritance tax, or a re wealth, you know, uh, real estate tax, or something. So, no new taxes, number one. Secondly, a great degree of transparency, frankness, honesty in presenting the true numbers. Thirdly, a sort of a fearless ambition about going to deficit spending all the way to 9.5% this year and 6.8% next year, and going down to 4.5% only after four years. So really fearlessness on, on this uh, thing like uh, the bogey of uh, rating agencies, of sovereign rating agencies, who so always treated India unfairly, I think. So that's the third factor. The fourth, of course, important thing is a huge space opening up for the private, sec private sector, including the use of the word P, the P word as they call it, privatization, disinvestment, uh, FDI and insurance. You know, for example, in real estate, the removal of the TDS uh, requirement for sovereign wealth funds and uh, foreign uh, funds that are coming into uh, real estate or infrastructure. And the fifth factor, I think, of course, is the overall uh, infrastructure push, the national infrastructure pipeline. And in particular, I think you know that for real estate in particular, uh, 
the extension of the tax holiday or whatever that affordable housing deadline or one year and uh, the huge uh, the actual data on the infrastructure pipeline you know by the way the national infrastructure pipeline the reason it's important is because it's got a lot of connectivity stuff going on you know whether it's roads ports rail, metro stations and you know connectivity has a spillover effect on real estate so uh, i'm not talking about the affordable housing part but just the fact that you have more connectivity means uh, so i i see that as a positive for real estate and of course there's a bunch of uh, reforms in in banking uh, including recapitalization and uh, uh, the the tax uh, exemption i think given us uh, on the affordable housing in some extension there um, uh, so i i know that one can be uh, do a little nitpicking and say oh more could have been done that's always the easiest thing to say about every budget is oh missed <laughs> opportunity on x y and z but i think as okay. you said and i heard you say in the in, uh, earlier uh, in our discussion that this is one of the best uh, years after a gap you know what happens is when you have a six seven year period of uh not so inspiring and not so appetizing outlook you kind of get used to it <laughs> and, and you don't realize when the good times have started so i think we are we are probably entering a multi-decadal uh, if not you know a decadal kind of a uh boom time if i can call it that i i'm not i'm not sound i'm trying not to sound like a pollyanna but I can give you more data to support what I'm trying to say in terms of the mega trends of urbanization and demography and so on. But maybe we should get that, get into that with, uh, with our conversation. Yes, so, absolutely. No, Dr. Anand, this is, you know, very nice and uh, absolute music to our, our ears. Uh, because, you know, real estate really piggybacks on the economy. If the economy is doing well, uh, more than likely that real estate will uh, continue to do well. I died sort of five or six, uh, uh, you know, quick questions if I can uh, ask you because, you, as I said, you know, amongst the best brains that we have, uh, what can go wrong from here on? Uh, I know there's a lot of positivity every day. You read the newspapers. You know, we are V-shaped recovery. Cases are coming down. Vaccine is there. Uh, you know, the tax collection has been one of its uh, highest, and uh, clearly the government seems to be in control of the situation. Uh, what do you think can possibly go wrong, which may derail? No, uh, before I say what can go wrong, I, I want to emphasize what you said about vaccine. See, the, the response to the pandemic is threefold. One is vaccination, which is preventive. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry, vaccination is treatment, actually. Uh, what, uh, then there is the protocol themselves, the so social distancing, the masks, and so on. And then there's treatment. You see, the recovery rate also has improved drastically. So we have learned quite a bit in the last eight or nine months. So let's not forget that. Uh, secondly, uh, on as you said, all the indicators, whether it's lead indicators like Purchasing Manager's Index, PMI, or it's IIP, or it's the GST monthly tax collections, or it's the accumulation to foreign reserves, or it's the stock market, you know, all, all these indicators, lead indicators are, are going in the right direction. In fact, IMF itself, has upgraded the outlook on India. And now IMF's growth forecast is higher than the growth forecast of the finance ministry, you know? So uh, what can go wrong in this recovery? Uh, see, there, there is always the devil uh, is in the implementation. I would say that's one thing that uh, the, uh, for example, vaccination, Mr. Nandan Vivekani says, we should, be vac we should be administering 5 million doses a day. And we are struggling to get to 1 million. So the, the you know, I don't know whether, um, uh, I, I don't know whether you should call this as a, as something that could go wrong, but instead of getting everybody vaccinated in eight or nine months, it'll take us a year and a half. But it's still progress, you know. The other thing is uh, I'm worried a little bit on the fact that the fiscal deficit, while it's ambitious and fearless in terms of the rating agencies, but we still have to fulfill 12 lakh crores of, you know, there's a shortage of 12 lakh crores. There's enough liquidity, uh, as you know, in the banking, but in trying to generate 12 lakh crores and leave enough, uh, we leave enough funds so that the private sector people can also borrow and real estate projects can take off. We might see uh, some upward pressure on interest rates, and that's definitely something to worry about. Because if one, if there's one variable that real estate industry is very sensitive about, as you know, especially commercial, is interest rates. So the RBI will ha will have to do a, a real super balancing act. On one hand, maintaining enough liquidity to make sure that the funding of the borrowing program goes through, 
but at the same time not have excessive liquidity so that it leads to inflation. And this is a, you know, I don't envy the task of the Reserve Bank. So I think that, that to me is, is something we need to be careful, watch, watch about. So the IMF, sorry, Kashmir, are you really saying something? No. Uh, so, sir, on the uh, the IMF is projecting. I, I I think various agencies are saying is GDP growth at eleven and a half percent for uh, for India. But if you were to look at the degrowth that has happened within the current financial year, you know, effectively it's probably three and a half percent. You know, your growth. When do you think we're going to get back to the pre-COVID levels uh, of growth in the economy or six seven? you know, 8% that we were talking about earlier. There is enough, uh, uh, there is enough room for actually an upside surprise. So this year, the growth rate, the current estimates are minus seven. So we are, we are not still through with this financial year, which ends in March. Minus seven might turn out to be minus five. And next year, plus 11 might turn out to be plus 12. Wow. So, so after uh, we, we, at the end of FY22, which is uh, March 22, we will have grown by around three, two, three percent in two years. So average growth of one percent, one and a half percent per year. But you, uh, but at this stage, we need to only look at the aggregate size. You know, India is a two hundred trillion, two twenty trillion uh, rupees economy. Uh, so, and we are getting close to three trillion dollar economy. So even at zero, I mean, this is my favorite line that when the uh, economy the size of U.S. when it grows at zero percent. That means it produces 17 million new cars. That when you produce 17 million new cars in the US, you're just growing at 0%. You're just producing same as last year. So when you have an economy, India's size is $3 trillion. So when you produce, let's say, uh, 10 lakh new homes, that is zero growth, you know, something like that. <laughs> so let's not, let's not uh, ignore the size of the economy. You're right that we need to be growing at much faster. Aspirational growth is maybe six, seven percent. We'll get to that in a couple of years. But uh, if you look at the V shape, so after the V shape, we'll be in two years, we'll be ahead by about two, three percent. Nice, nice. No, this makes it very clear. And sir, yeah. everywhere that we read, you know, when events took place, uh, you know, like the World War II uh, took place, you know, there was a geopolitical change uh, that happened and the rankings of the countries in the world order changed. Uh, do you think India will go up on the ranking as we come out through this pandemic? There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. I told you that mega trends, for example, demography, in the next 20, 30 years, 35 years, India is going to add 250 million uh, people to the workforce. In that same period, China is going to subtract 150 million from the workforce. And India and China, this is a century which belongs to India and China, frankly. We, India and China together account for 40% of humanity. Whatever you might think in terms of Indo-China relationships, this is a century where the center of gravity has decisively shifted to the Eastern Hemisphere. The growth is going to be concentrated in Southeast Asia, East Asia. And India, there is no doubt in my mind that India is, uh, is definitely the growth center. And, and, uh, and the mega trends are, are the mega trends like demography, urbanization, all these are uh, in India's favor. Going back to your first question, what worries me? Yeah, I said interest rates in the in the short run uh, this year because of the borrowing program. But of course, we one other thing that we need to worry about, which is not really something that you can deal with in, on a yearly basis, is that we should not let our inequality get out of hand. Whether it's income inequality or wealth inequality or regional equality, we should, uh, we should keep an eye on that. That's the consequence of growth. That's not the determinant. But this is something that that's why policymakers need to keep an eye on that as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, sir. sir. If there is inequality, you know, it can create a huge amount of disruption, uh, you know, within uh, within the structure, uh, you know, of our of our country. And clearly, that is one thing that we cannot uh, afford at uh, at this stage. And the last one that uh, I had is that you, know, you briefly touched about it, uh, and you know, it is a little concerning that the low interest regime uh, may not continue. Uh, for a long, uh, what do you think is the real probability of this low interest regime not continuing, uh, given the balance, as you rightly said, has to be done between liquidity and uh, the interest rates? Yeah, that was the first question you asked about what is what is the worrying, you know, what what mm -hmm. what uh, what is the risk? So, because we have a large borrowing program, and we we have a large borrowing program because 
the government is ambitious about its fiscal spending. It's ambitious about its pump priming. It's ambitious about fiscal expansion. And, uh, and to that extent, since we need to f fund that borrowing, uh, it, it will come from the same space of loanable funds, which is the bank deposits and savers. And uh, at the same time, private sector also has to grow. So the same pool of funds is going to be available for the private sector as well. And in that in that tussle, in the tug of war of you know the, the big gorilla, which is government of India borrowing 12 lakh crores, and maybe another 10 lakh crores being borrowed by the, by the private sector, in this tussle, uh, maybe the, the pool of savings and liquidity won't be enough. And that's where the interest rates are going up. But remember, the world has lived with zero interest rates now for 10 yes. years, 12 years, 10 years at least, 11 years since 2009. So if we can't borrow domestically, we should borrow overseas. Those, those stronger players, especially which, who have access to dollar funds, should actually access the uh, overseas markets. This year, I believe the rupee is actually going to get stronger. So if you the borrow today at an exchange rate of 74, Next year you'll be repaying at an exchange rate of seventy-three. So actually, faster oh. borrowing will go down. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that you take unhedged forex, forex risk, and I'm not saying go and start gambling in the foreign exchange market. <laughs> but India's uh, India's exchange rate and rupee is is actually on a stable path, stability, and in fact, on this, uh, it's an appreciating bias. So that will attract foreign funds into India. So we should look at the pool of savings, not just in India, but overseas as well. And to that extent, the interest rate pressure will be lower. But I won't be surprised if there's slight inching up uh, uh, of interest rates from a very low, not very low to maybe slightly moderately higher. That has never deter deterred growth, by the way. As you know, the mid 90s we had uh, seven eight percent growth. I mean, interest rates were at 16, 17 percent. Yes, that's right. We, we are the 10 year GCE at five five or six percent, so we are much lower. So I don't think that should deter us from the growth growth aspiration. And then you're absolutely right, uh, Dr. Andre. You know, the home loan rates used to be 16, 17, 18 percent. And yet we were seeing, uh, you know, growth in the GDP of uh, 7, 8, 9 percent. You get a 15-year 50, home loan. At... It's possible. That's right. I'm not here to, you know, to get any home loans, but I, I've, I've been quoted that number. So. <laughs> No, this is fantastic. I can tell you, uh, Dr. Andre, the audience would like me to go on and on. This is so positive. This is absolute music uh, to everyone's ears. Uh, and you're fantastic. If, uh, if, if the country, if the economy can really arrest the downfall in the GDP growth within this financial year and correspondingly have an upliftment on the projected growth of 11.5%, uh, you know, we're going to come out real winners. And as you rightly said, is that the you know, geopolitical situation uh, is going to be in favor of India and China. And you know, whatever we say about the relationships between, uh, between China and India, I mean, these are the two uh, mammoth economies. And this is where we are going to largely see uh, the the growth. I know we've uh, run out of time. Uh, I'm going to quickly, um, you know, announce the uh, the unveiling of uh, our consumer sentiment survey. And Dr. Anade, you'll be quite uh, uh, in, uh, excited to see uh, what the survey has said on real estate purchase. And uh, they've given their perspective from the lens of the consumer. And this is a beautiful comparison between pre and post COVID. Uh, so if we can unveil uh, the report uh, digitally, uh, Asim, that will be great. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Asim. Uh, we, we, uh, I'll just give you a quick uh, highlights, uh, you know, eight or ten points uh, on this one, uh, what we have uh, seen uh, in uh, during the survey uh, in the report uh, you know clearly uh, from pre covid level when there were 54% of the survey uh, attendees who had said they would love to buy a property and it was an ideal time for them to buy a property from 54% it has moved to 62% uh, so you know clearly it has moved in uh, favor of uh, what uh, exactly Mohit was also saying uh, that we're, we're starting to see a lot more interest come in from the home buyers. It is clearly an end user market. You will see uh, after I finish giving you anecdotes on the report, uh, there's a presentation two minute video on that. And clearly a higher demand 
for larger homes. And, uh, uh, you know, Kashmir, ma'am, you and I were discussing about this. Uh, we're saying is because of work from home has become very popular. People are asking that extra half a room, half a bedroom. So instead of two rooms, it's two and a half room, three room, in, you know, it is three and a half rooms. Uh, the demand is largely on the peripherally locations of the city. Uh, previously, it used to be the central business district or the suburban. Now they're going to the periphery because they're saying we're likely to come in probably two or three days a week in the office. We want a larger home at the periphery and we'll spend more money on buying a larger home rather than buy buying it closer to the city. Huge amount of demand for plotted developments where people are wanting their own plots and they want to build their own home. So row houses, villas, uh, they don't want their uh, destiny to be linked with their neighbors in the event that the neighbors catch a virus, the full uh, you know, floor was getting sealed. So a lot of demand on plotted uh, developments. There's a lot of demand for uh, newly launched projects. Uh, so it does appear that there is belief in the Real Estate Regulation Act, and suddenly we are starting to see demand come in from the home buyers uh, on launched projects, which wasn't really there. Um, Mohit uh, earlier touched on this. Uh, the share of reputed developers from financial year 2017, which was at 17% of the overall market, has moved to 44%. Uh, at the end of uh, 2020. So you bought a dramatic change, exactly what China did. Uh, we are looking to do that. Uh, there is a new breed of uh, developers uh, who's come in and Dr. Andre, one of them is your firm uh, as well, which has got into real estate, into active uh, real estate uh, development. And uh, we hope that this is beginning of uh, 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 an upcycle uh, that uh, we look at it from uh, here onwards. Uh,